Hey guys, welcome to the Electromaker Meta Maker Podcast, episode four. I am really excited to sit down and talk to Mike Darby. He is a self-confessed technology-loving nerd and has a passion for making sci-fi a reality. You'll find among his awesome projects, an artificial life project, a Terminator-inspired Raspinator, and a Star Trek-inspired The Scorpion robotics device. You can follow him at the underscore Mikey underscore D on Twitter, and check out his website, 314reactor, 314reactor.com. If you want to follow us, you can check us out at electromaker.io. You can follow us on Twitter at electromaker.io, on Facebook at electromaker.io, and on Instagram at electromaker underscore io. And if you want to follow me, Senior Editor Mo Long, you can check me out at Mitchell C. Long on Twitter and Instagram. So how's your how's your day been? Yeah, it's been good, man. Um, just been a nice, quiet day. How's yours been? Been pretty good. I'm kind of. I guess you're at the end of yours, and I'm kind of in the uh, middle of mine. Oh yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, been been nice. Been like a work from home day. I work remotely every day, but sometimes I go into like a working space. But today I just needed some work from the apartment time and uh, and hang out with the dog. Oh, so, nice. <laughs> That's been good. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, really, uh, really excited to uh, chat with you. Um, I've, you know, checked out a lot of your projects, so good to kind of talk to you in person. Yeah, it's it's uh, it's very it's very uh, humbling to uh, yeah. Um, so, uh, I guess the first thing that I wanted to kind of chat about was tell me. I know I know about your. Uh, maker projects but what do you do for work uh, i work as a uh, qa engineer uh, for a small company in england ipswich so i just uh test software pretty much okay so did you kind of get into the maker space after being hands-on with software or did you get into software after being hands-on with hardware or was it a little bit of both i think i've always been into software and hardware ever since i was very very young so it kind of just led into my career and then uh, when the Raspberry Pi and stuff came out, I kind of got into that. So it's kind of before either, really. I was into both. Um, so, yeah. That's really cool. So can you talk a little bit about your maker origin story then? Uh, yeah. I first got a Raspberry Pi back in 2013, and I got a little bored with it. Um, like a little, just got a little LEDs and a little buzzer on it. And it was before the the hats were released, so you just had these little experimental boards where you made your own, and I played around Python a bit, and then I kind of ran out of ideas for a while what to do with it, and then suddenly, I think around 2014, I don't know what happened, but I just suddenly had like hundreds of ideas flooding in and in and in, and then I kind of just couldn't stop making stuff, if that makes any sense. Absolutely. What, what I tend to find is it's a little bit addicting. You know, once you start making, once you make one project and you start receiving other projects to make and kind of progress from more basic projects to more hardcore DIY tasks. Yeah. <laughs> and what initially sparked your interest in the Raspberry Pi? Uh, I heard about it in 2011, roundabouts, and I thought that's... That's pretty cool. It's just like it, I, the way it was advertised was a little credit card sized computer. So I thought of, well, that'd be cool to get Linux on it and stuff. But then when I actually got it, I realized the, the more hardware application side of it. And I was like, oh, OK, so there's a lot to do here in terms not just running Linux on it and using it as a PC, but using it as a, a platform to build pretty much anything on. Um, and ever since I was a kid, I wanted to build stuff like that. And this really gave the opportunity because it's so simple to work with. So, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. And also just how many other competitor boards there are, like the Banana Pi, the Orange Pi, the Ultra X U4. Oh, yeah, yeah. So the, the Makerspace 
especially dev boards, have really blossomed in that regard. Yeah, they really have. It's crazy. You mentioned the Raspberry Pi. What technology, software, hardware do you enjoy working with the most and why? Uh, in terms of making my own stuff, it's probably... I don't, I don't, I, I, I don't know. I think it's just everything. I can't really pick one specific thing. In terms of... It's, really, it's a really hard question because in terms of what I do, in terms of messing around with computers, I love everything. I love everything from graphics cards to Raspberry Pis. Um, but probably the most interesting stuff is probably AI sort of things with it because you can now get TensorFlow on Raspberry Pi and I really want to get to grips with that. So it's that kind of more forward-thinking experimental stuff that I really like. But at the same time, it's... Yeah, just any sort of technology gives me joy. <laughs> That was an excellent answer and uh, and definitely shows that you're a maker. <laughs> Thank you. So the AI part really intrigues me. One of uh, my favorite projects that you did was your artificial life project. So can you talk a little bit about what some of your favorite projects that you've done are and kind of how you come up with your ideas for projects that you decide to make? Uh, my own favorite projects I've made are uh, probably the... F Probably my favorite that has a lot of um, history to it and um, a lot of future to it as well is probably the, the Raspinator because there's a lot more I can do with that the more I learn. Um, and it's also influenced by Terminator because I love those films. Um, so that, and that's kind of where I get a lot of my ideas from is films, especially Terminator 1 and 2, not the others, obviously. Um, <laughs> that's and, the um, right answer. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, because Terminator 2 is just a film that resonates with me, and it just gets more and more relevant every year, so that directly interlinks with it. And also, like, the Marvel the Marvel films as well. I just want to... I look at the technology in them, and I want to make it real. And one day, I just really want to have an Iron Man suit, so that's how I get a lot of my ideas, <laughs> just trying to take something that's really abstract or from a movie and then just try and make it real, no matter how impossible that seems. Yeah, that creativity is definitely what makes the DIY electronic space especially so intriguing. And uh, I definitely, uh, one reason that I enjoy a lot of your projects, for one, they're really cool. The other, I, I definitely could see the film inspiration behind a lot of them. And you can probably see in the background. <laughs> <Yep. junkie. laughs> That's cool. Uh, so what are some of your favorite films that portray tech in either a really good way or a really terrible way? Uh, uh, well, I'd say in a good way, it's probably, probably the Marvel films because they, well, the, the stuff that Stark does, obviously, he's a fundamentally good person after Iron Man 1. And the technology is directly interlinked with that. Um, just trying to think of other films now. The good uses of technology. Um, in terms of bad, though, Terminator 2, again, is, uh, is an interesting one. Because it's not just bad technology, but how we reacted to it. Because uh, Skynet became self-aware. And then we reacted by trying to unplug it. So it kind of defended itself. So that's a kind of mixed bag of, you know, it had a, probably a good application. But the way we reacted to it was bad. So that's kind of a grey area, and that's also what I kind of enjoy as well. And there's stuff like Altered Carbon, which is um, a very good technology. It can be put to some really good use, but in terms of application, a lot of people kind of abuse the technology, and you get a lot of high-up people using it, and uh, lesser fortunate people not really being able to use it that much. So that's, that's another kind of grey area. So it's kind of hard to pick and choose like that. Yeah, those were awesome examples. And even Terminator 2, uh, trying to unplug Skynet, even kind of calls back to HAL from 2001 Space Odyssey with kind of fighting back as a defense mechanism. That's it, yeah. That's exactly it. That. So that's, that's super cool to explore. Definitely. So your projects are often kind of more uh, difficult or moderate. So what's a challenge that you've had on a recent project 
and how did you overcome that challenge? Hmm. What's my, what's my next project? Probably there was a uh, most recent example, probably trying to get the Raspinator to come up with decent responses with the chatbot program because it's so uh, difficult to get something to respond in a remotely human way. And the way I did it was go back to basics of how anyone sort of learns. I mean, you, you observe from the world around you interactions with other people. And when someone interacts with you, if you don't necessarily first understand it, you react back. And then you see their reaction come back, and then you notice other people's reactions. So I kind of programmed it to take your reactions against its reactions and then flip that around if it is another response come in because it can use a human response back, if that makes any sense. So it kind of just learns from examples, like it's heard stuff before. So if you say something to it that it's heard before, it will have a response to it from your own responses to it. So that's how I sort of overcome that, if that makes any sense. <laughs> it does. And chatbots especially seem to be a little more predominant mm. of late. So do you have any sort of thoughts on how those will continue to evolve? I imagine uh, with sort of deep learning stuff, uh, machine learning stuff, they'll uh, probably end up getting sort of plugged into wide ar arrays of languages and language models and probably it'll be more sort of mass learning sort of stuff as well as I imagine you get two types of chatbot ones that will like mass learning where they learn a whole load of interactions and then singular ones that learn from individual interactions and they'll both develop quite differently because you'll have ones that have unique personalities from talking to individual people and then you'll have the ones that just learn from everything on the internet and they'll be sort of scarily smart sort of chatbots. So I think that's probably where they'll go. A lot of deep learning, a lot of uh, TensorFlow kind of stuff like that. I think that's probably where it's going to go. That makes sense. So you've used a lot of different technology from kind of more accessible hardware such as Raspberry Pis to chatbots, which the average or beginner maker probably doesn't use. Do you have any sort of technology that you haven't been able to get hands on with yet that you'd really like to? Hmm. Probably the more sort of complex machine learning stuff like TensorFlow. I haven't tried that yet. I need to get on that and get learning that because that's really complicated. Um, and I'm, I'm quite a slow learner, really, so it's going to take me a while to get around to it. Um, but yeah, that's one technology I really want to get on board with TensorFlow because that opens up a lot of opportunities to get some get really good sort of hands-on with uh, machine learning and see, see what I can get to do with it. And then possibly put that in the next Raspinator as well. That would be awesome. And I'm yeah. glad you mentioned kind of the next version because you made the Windows 98 wristwatch and then you just debuted 2.0. <laughs> yeah which I'm really excited about. Windows XP was one of my favorite operating systems, so I might have yeah. to try to replicate that on. So thanks for that. Uh, but how do you pick and choose which of your projects you update? Um, I think I, I kind of look over them and, and I, I either look over them and go, I can improve that one this way, or a new technology has come out. Um, and I can improve it. Like the uh, Artificial Life project, there's been a new higher resolution unicorn hat, and there's also the new uh, LED cubes that are on Pimeroni now. Um, and I really want to make like a 3D version and then like a super HD version with the massive unicorn hat we've got. Um, so I kind of look at the technology perspective, but also while I'm making them, I'm, I kind of have an idea beforehand of what I want at the end of the process. Like I really want, uh, I basically aim for like a self-aware skull and then kind of built my way to that and then as I'm building it, I'm kind of like well I've gotten this far this is like stage one I can wrap this up learn what I can from that and then for stage two down the line when I've learned a lot more I can then implement that and then as I go from other projects I learn other technologies and then that feeds into the next project and so on and so forth so it's kind of I've got an idea in my head and I kind of work toward that slowly um, I think that 
yeah, pretty much my process. <laughs> That's a really awesome iterative process. Thank you. Yeah. So you tend to have a lot of projects that are very like public facing. Do you have any particularly interesting or unique interactions that you've had with fellow makers or fans? Um, yeah, I've, uh, there was one person that took my um, uh, my Nerf gun ammo counter project, uh, and they improved it and like did loads of three D printed parts of it and stuff, and then put it on their own Nerf weapon and made it really cool. Um, and I thought that was really cool because someone's taken my idea and because I, I want to put my ideas out there for people to improve and learn from, and then feed it. You know, it feeds into the overall open source world that's out there. And then for someone to look at my idea and go, that's cool, I want to improve it and make my own thing with it, was really amazing. And I was like, that's so awesome that somebody actually thought my rubbish thing was so cool that they want to actually play with it. Um, so yeah, that's cool. And then on the more, not, not really negative side, but some people uh, make very valid comments that um, some of my stuff isn't so well made and I could 3D print a bit more, which is, it's true, I agree with them on that because... A lot of my stuff is very prototypey, and it doesn't look very aesthetically pleasing often. <laughs> the, the way you phrased that was really fascinating, and it's something that I really love about open source communities, is the way someone will improve upon something someone else has created, whether it's hardware, whether it's uh, code, and rather than being upset about that, it brings joy. So that's what oh, yeah. I really like about the maker community. Yeah, it's amazing. It's really, it's really amazing. And you were talking about someone kind of improving on something you'd created. So on the flip side of that, what makers do you follow on a regular basis and inspire you? Uh, there's um, someone who works for Hackster. I think her name is Alex Glow. I've seen a lot of her projects. She's quite inspirational. Um, just this people who's just very clever far cleverer than me, um, they can just make all these really cool things. Um, and I generally, I can't think of any names, but I see stuff people have made, like the uh, portable Game Boy stuff, um, and other such, um, like really common projects that inspire me. And I sort of go, yeah, I want to try my hand at that. Or like the, the I made a portable pipe recently, uh, like a little pocket thing that was inspired by a bunch of other projects. Um, so yeah, it's just pretty much the, the sea of it that's out there, I just kind of get inspiration from. But often my stuff isn't as good as their stuff by any. <laughs> <laughs> You're so humble. <laughs> I, I I try to be because I realise I, I think I'm very very lucky. I mean, just sitting here having an interview with someone right now who thinks my stuff is cool is is amazing because it's like wow, someone thinks my stuff is cool. Um, so yeah, I try and keep very level headed on it um, because there's always more to learn as well. That's that's another good thing. Absolutely. So, what advice would you give to someone first starting out in the DIY space? I would say just uh, pick a simple board like a Raspberry Pi or a Arduino and then just hook it up and just start building stuff. It doesn't matter whether it's just a little LED flashing or anything really. Just uh, do, do anything your imagination can uh, come up with and then uh, there's loads of great communities out there, like obviously uh, you know, Hackster, Electromaker, um, uh, lots of communities on Reddit where you can post your stuff and people will respond to it. And then, yeah, just keep making and thinking about stuff. So I think, um, like I did, you, people may run into a sort of area where they can't think of anything to do, but eventually if you just keep, if you just let your imagination flow, eventually you'll just think the opportunities are limitless. Definitely. And that's kind of the beauty of a lot of the projects that you see. Even something as simple as blinking an LED is immensely satisfying when you've never done that before. And then it kind of gets you excited about moving on to bigger and better projects. Definitely. It's also really nice when you see people in the comment section being supportive of uh, the more basic maker endeavors. Definitely. So, we talked a little bit about movies earlier. What is one film that you would recommend 
every DIYer and maker watch and why? Mm. <laughs> oh. oh, that's a good one. So, it would probably have to be probably Iron Man because it, it just sort of shows his ingenuity is uh, so inspirational the way he can just sort of uh, knock up the Mark 1 suit in a cave while under surveillance and then he sort of just busts his way up and just sort of wins the game, makes the Mark 2, the Mark 3. It's just that kind of... And again, that's what's... That's what's another reason why is because it's, he goes from the Mark 1, the Mark 2, the Mark 3. That kind of iterative process is so inspirational to me. So yeah, definitely, I'd say Iron Man because, yeah, Tony Stark is just... Yeah, he's cool. Absolutely. <laughs> and even though it's sci-fi in... What was it? Iron Man 3, he's got the box. And then, yeah. of course, in Ultron, even though I didn't think Ultron was the best of the Avengers films or the MCU, it was still, a, it was still fun. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that kind of focus on AI as well as the iterative process was actually kind of intelligent. And I think mm. the average Marvel fan might not kind of recognize that. Hey, guys. Thanks again for listening. It was a pleasure to talk to Mike Darby. And I know I'm really looking forward to seeing what projects he comes out with next. If you want to follow him, you can check him out at the underscore Mikey underscore D on Twitter and at 314reactor.com. You can check us out at electromaker.io on the internet. You can check us out at Electromaker.io on Twitter and Electromaker.io on Facebook, as well as on Instagram at Electromaker underscore IO. And if you want to follow me, Senior Editor Mo Long, you can keep up with me at Mitchell C. Long on Twitter and Instagram. Thanks for listening, and let me know what makers you want me to feature on the Electromaker Media Maker podcast.